Okay, I found a way to temporarily, at least, get through this business on Jerome without having to change computers yet. What I'd started to say was that Jerome's, if this is about Jerome, big if, then his birth is marked right here at 347. First syllable here, Oppo of Oppo Bino. And it's kind of clever if it is him because uh, it means to descend from a ship, which is the same idea as birth, because the key word for church is pleroma, and pleroma means to fill up a ship or a woman with cargo. Okay, so it's clever, and this is the kind of finesse that Luke does, so it's not out of character to to be playing that. Um, if that's true, then Jerome is 12 years old here, and as you can see down here, this is a wiki article on him. He apparently was baptized somewhere between 360 and 366 A.D. Well, if it was 360, then that's right here at the beginning of Tete. Okay? And Tete comes from um, Tithmi, which kind of means to settle, to stand, to take a stand, to make up your mind. And this verse here is make up your mind and you, you know, make up your heart. It's the believing part of your mind. Um, not to rehearse what you're going to say beforehand because the, the overall context is that you're going to be taken. Remember, I, I was explaining in earlier videos that this was about the uh, persecution that was going to happen under Constantine. Okay, and by this point it's 346 A.D., which is when, um, just after Constantine died and all of his kids were busy, um, were busy murdering their own relatives. And then each other, they went to, into civil war over whether or not, um, God was one or three. And so he's warning them, you know, that there's going to be wars and you have to be on your guard. And you're going to be delivered over. Um, see, here's the word for delivered over. Uh, delivered over to the churches. And there were a whole bunch of councils and all that stuff under Constantine and under his sons about who was a heretic. All right? And so in the context of that, he's saying, you know, this is an opportunity. The word apobino means... it. it it means to come down off a ship, literally, um, but it also means it, it creates a new opportunity and here for your witness. So in the context of the text, it's saying don't worry about the fact that you're going to be, you know, the subject of civil war between the kingdoms and the churches, which of course are Constantine's sons, um, and who comes after them. Because God's going to use it as an opportunity for a witness. Now notice that in the previous verse here, the opportunity for a witness, this is 346 A.D., which is when this stuff really starts up, there's a 63 here, which means that there was a substantial group of believers who through this terrible time was growing. Okay, it means that, that, that the teachers, there were enough teachers if this is about the teachers, there were enough teachers and enough students to make for a good period, but the overall effect was not a 70. Okay? So it's a good report card and a bad report card, and you can sort of see why. Because if you've got all this delivering over to the churches, the local churches, see, this is a condemnation of the local churches. Okay? Busy with their councils and who's a heretic and all other crap, okay? And then this is the kings, and the kings at this time are Constantine's sons, and by 346, they had murdered, literally murdered. See, Constantine dies in 337, okay? So if you walk this back seven syllables to onomatosmu, that's six, to onomatosmu, that's six syllables. So, and they can. Just at the can. Constantine dies in the middle of the verse. That's not good. In the middle of the word. Okay. 
it's, it's a condemnation of him, just like in the Ephesians text, okay? So, the fight that they have over these next seven years is with each other, killing their own relatives, and they all take different different positions on whether God is one or three, and then they all fight with each other, whole civil wars over that. And all that is starting up just about here. All right. Well, in 347, our boy Jerome is born. And he's born during the period that says, you know, it's an opportunity for your witness. And he's 12 years old at this point. Now, if, as it says down here, he was baptized in 360, that means he was 13. And that's an important period of time. It could be as late as six years later when he was 19. It's not so important that he was baptized, I mean, because the, the whole sacrimony of back, baptism in that day and age was really, um, what do you want to call it, apostate. So he's sort of starting out on the wrong road. He's starting out on the official mainstream Christian road, okay? And this is saying, you know, make up your mind in your heart, make up your mind, make up your belief, that you're not going to rehearse what you're going to say when you're under attack. Because that's the context of the previous verse. Okay, this is this is for a testimony. And make up your mind, you're not going to rehearse. So where it's starting to say make up your mind, if he was baptized at 13, then that's when he's learning to make up his mind. Okay? Tete un en te tais cardiais. That's eight years later. So right where the cursor is in Humon, or well, Cardi, Cardi, all right, so Tete is two, three, four, five, six, okay, so he'd be 19 there, in the middle of Cardi ice. Yeah, I mean, when you're 19, you know, you're just starting to learn to have a heart, starting to learn what to believe, Okay. He's 33 by the end of this 21. Now, it's not necessarily referencing him, but it could be. Because this is 379, and in 379, he had had six years earlier some sort of vision, which does not bode well for this guy's understanding of Bible. But, as a result of him having his vision, see, he had a vision, Call him to lay a secular studies because he's trying to be a philosopher and devote himself to God. He seems to have abstained for a considerable time from the study of classics and plunged deeply into that Bible. Well, okay. So he had a fake vision from the demon boys or something. But that caused him to want Bible. Okay, well, God's going to honor that. Doesn't matter how he got there. Okay? So then he's studying under some guy Apollonarius of Laodicea. And apparently, Polinarius was judged heretical by the official teachers of the day, which might mean that Polinarius actually learned the Bible, or it could mean he was a goofball in a different way. Okay, and especially because our boy, our boy uh, Jerome decides he's going to have a life of ascetic penance. That's not what the Bible calls for. But, if you're going there and you want to actually study Bible, well, okay, so then he goes to, to Antioch, and then he he's playing hermit. But, if he, studied in, if he studied Bible and wrote, and he's learning Hebrew, and he's, you know, going with the Jews to learn Hebrew, that's all good. So, on the one hand, he's a goofball, and on the other hand, he's going in the right direction. All right. Now he ends up becoming, see, returning to Antioch in 378 to 379, he was ordained. So now he's going in a wrong direction. But he had some growth. So if this is talking about him personally or people he was around, 379, which you see highlighted now in dark gray, unfortunately, okay, is when he was ordained as part of the official. Now he's part of the official Catholic thing, okay, at the end. Because he's still goofball enough, he can't tell the difference between real doctrine 
and what he learned but he did grow some and he does know something about Hebrew and he wants to learn the Hebrew and the Greek and collect the scriptures okay so that's good but that's the last time it's good and what's so astonishing to me if this is talking about him okay this is 379 then this goes 13 years not 14 years 13 years more 379 389 uh, 392, because he lives until 420, okay, and remember this is 387 plus 30, so that's 417 at the end, then what he does from 379 forward, even though it's got a huge impact on church, apparently doesn't have any spiritual impact on him, that's pretty. that's a pretty devastating thing to say. This is the guy, more than anybody else in his time, who went about trying to find the manuscripts, Hebrew and Greek, and correct the old Latin translation. That's what he's known for. And he finished it about 405 A.D. So we got 379 is the end there. 389, 392. He hadn't yet finished it okay 389 and 3 is 392 so if you want to get to 405 that's 393 394 395 396 397 398 399 400 401 402 403 404 405. So it's not exactly as good as it should have been. But it did have a huge impact. It had a huge impact at the time because what, what ended up happening is as he was doing the translation, he was giving it out. He was arguing with Augustine over even doing it. Augustine didn't want him to do it, especially from the Hebrew. And as he's doing it, he's giving it out, and individuals that he knew were getting what he retranslated. And then they were compiling it also. All right? And then they were giving it out. So you had a bunch of individuals around 405 and following, because this takes you all the way to 417 A.D. You had a bunch of individuals who were getting the text, but it what? But the official Christendom that he allegedly belonged to, because he was actually doing this translation under Pope Damasus. Okay, it, it, he was he was commissioned to do it under Pope Damasus, but. What, when the Bible's only doing 38 here, okay, it's not even 7. It's saying that, that the growth didn't occur in him or in the people who got it then. But down here, by the time you get to 450, this is still a bad number. This is saying temple down, okay? But you'll notice that we got the 49 here, and then we got another 126 here. So when the 49 is here, that's analogous to Israel, you know, having 49 years, you know, outside the land, and now it's time to rebuild, okay? And, and this 126 is basically saying she really didn't, the church really isn't growing from this. But at the same time, something's going on. It's not totally zero. It's not totally bad. It's just, it's, as it were, establishment Christianity remains in the tank. So if there's growth in here, in any of these numbers that aren't orange, they're individuals who are growing. Okay. Now what was happening during this time? Well, 469 is 499, you know, A.D. 505 is 535 A.D. And one of the things that starts to happen here, okay, and it really starts at the, you know, this is 483, 
okay? Around about in here, you got Columba. Well, you don't actually have Columba yet. You start to have missionaries, okay? And about here at 535, you have what's this, the first establishment of what be, would become a lot of monasteries under a guy that's called St. Benedict. He's called St. Posthumously, of course. But Benedict was a guy who really wanted to, what do you want to call it? He really wanted to establish a life separate from establishment Christianity. There's a breakout of individuals. Not, you know, Jerome happened to be like them, where he's ostensibly writing under Pope Damasus, but he's living apart from establishment Christianity. There is a, he's one of a sort of slowly starting movement of people who just want the Bible, and they just want to learn it, and they're going to call themselves Catholic so they can get it, but other than that, they really don't want much to do with the Catholic Church. And Benedict decided he was going to start a whole bunch of monasteries, which he does in 529. And this is 535. So saying 49 here is saying, okay, it's like the Bible has been in the tank. And that's what really happened with Jerome's translation, too, is it wasn't accepted as mainstream, but it was accepted by individuals. And so now there's this development here of monasteries and the question is and and it's not real easy to find out the question is how much of Jerome's translation was being used in the monasteries for versus the official old Latin there's mixed evidence that Jerome's translation and the old Latin were sort of coexisting and I'm getting that from Christopher de Hamel's book about the history of the Bible he doesn't know of the meter, and I would love to know if we could find old manuscripts which have meter in them, you know, where the meter's marked, because I would think that the, those manuscripts ought to exist, but so far I'm not finding any evidence that they do, you know, because if I know of this, wouldn't any of the monks copying it have noticed, you know, but I can't prove that. In any event, what you have going on here in the monasteries is that some of them are using what Jerome wrote. And when Jerome translated it, he was using current Latin of his day, fixing the old Latin and fixing the, the mistranslations in it, but updating it to current Latin of his day. And what was basically the problem was is that main, the mainstream um, official churches weren't accepting his vernacular Latin. They wanted to use the old Latin because it sound, you know, it was the words that everybody accepted. They didn't like new words being used, even if they were more accurate. But not everybody held to that view. So if he's more properly translating the Latin from the Hebrew and the Greek, and some of them are accepting it, and some of them aren't, you would expect the numbers that you see here not to be seven. But at the same time, it gets seven here by 616, which is 646. And by this time, 646, the Benedictine monasteries are in full flower, mostly um, in France, um, to some extent in what we would start to call Germany. They were really moving up, which means that there was an interest in learning Bible here. Now the question is, is this 646 with its 21 prior referencing anybody specific? And the answer is, I don't know. I gotta look it up. So that'll be the next increment.